Dr. Willa Shoy has been working with the diabetes population for over three decades now, and she's making it her mission to raise awareness about prediabetes in the American population. Please help me welcome to the Brudex stage, Dr. Willa Shoy. Thank you. The villain of my story lurks everywhere. This villain comes in all shapes and sizes. Unfortunately, this villain doesn't take pounds of flesh, but actually adds pounds of flesh. The result is obesity. And from obesity, we develop type 2 diabetes. So I want to tell you a story today about what we're doing in the Ohio State University uh, Diabetes and Metabolic Research Center to try to curb this epidemic of type 2 diabetes. We call it an epidemic because there are 29 million people in the United States with diabetes, and there's 86 million people with prediabetes. And we're going to focus a little more on prediabetes because I believe it's a real forgotten problem. How many of you in this audience know someone with diabetes? There's not, there's almost not one hand that didn't go up. This is a really prevalent disease. So imagine that you're very hungry all the time. Maybe you're hungry now. And you eat, and you keep eating, and soon your weight is over 250 pounds. Then it becomes 300 pounds. You start to get blurry vision. You get really thirsty. You start having to get up at night five and six times to go to the bathroom. Some of us think, oh, maybe it's just old age. But it's not. You go to your physician, and he or she says, you have type 2 diabetes. You get started on some pills. Some of you may be lucky to just have one pill. Some have three or four pills to start with. And the problem is your glucose levels keep rising. Your blood sugar keeps rising. And pretty soon, your doctor says, well, now you've passed the pill stage. Now you need insulin. So you have to take insulin maybe four or five times a day. And every time you take your insulin, you have to prick your uh, finger to check your blood glucose to see what it is. Now, that's not the only, the end of the story. Because now you're starting to have more visual problems. And your doctor says, oh, you need, you have diabetic retinopathy. You need treatment for that. And then maybe a year down the road, he or she says, you are on the road to dialysis. And with all of this going on, your feet become numb. They burn every night, and they're in pain, so you can't sleep. What happens? You step on something sharp in your house. You get a foot infection, and pretty soon that foot comes off. So diabetes is the most common cause of adult blindness, end-stage kidney disease, and non-traumatic amputations in the United States. This is a terrible situation, but that's not the end of it. That's why we have to stop this disease. Diabetes and obesity target nearly every organ in the body for damage. Patients with obesity and diabetes have early dementia, early Alzheimer's disease, and we know how terrible that is. They can have sleep apnea. Many of you have heard of it. Um, I've gone through the airport, particularly in Denver, Colorado, and I see signs that say, oh, get your CPAP machine at such and such a company, uh, and you get a better price. So many, many people now understand sleep apnea and that we have to have this very cumbersome machine to be able to sleep without having to wake up and stop breathing. That's a serious problem. We have early heart disease, uh, myocardial infarction or heart attack, and stroke with type 2 diabetes. Then the other problem, another major problem, is when we're obese, our liver can fill up with fat this leads to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or an inflammatory problem in the liver that can end up in cirrhosis. And it's emerging that 
fatty liver is going to be the most common cause of end-stage liver disease and ultimately require liver transplantation. And it doesn't even stop there because these patients have peripheral vascular disease and they can't walk very far without having leg pain. So all of this is adding up to not only continued obesity, but in it because of an inability to exercise. And ultimately, cancer develops. And in obesity, as you've just heard, there's higher rates of certain kinds of cancers, like breast cancer, colon cancer, or prostate cancer. So this is what we set the stage for in patients with obesity and diabetes. So it's a chronic, prolonged, lifelong disease. So your physician says, okay, so now you have to work hard to get your diabetes under control. And in fact, as for example with retinopathy, as a marker of diabetes increases, hemoglobin A1C, we see a progressive increase in the risk of retinopathy. So we work hard to get our glucoses down to normal that we talked about, but what happens? Now we risk severe hypoglycemia um, as our glucoses get better. So the lower here, the better. What about hypoglycemia? Well, first you just get sweaty, nervous, and shaky, and you know you have to eat something, but this can lead to uh, loss of consciousness, altered consciousness, ultimately ep uh, epileptic seizures can happen, and ultimately, you totally lose consciousness. And we've all heard stories about people driving, getting hypoglycemia, and then having terrible accidents where they and others in the road can lose their lives. So now you're walking this terrible tightrope where, oh, I need to get my blood glucose under control, but if I get it too under control, I might die because my blood blood glucose goes too low. So this is a really, really difficult um, disease, as you can see, to live with. So we have an OSU Diabetes and Metabolism Research Center that was made an official college center by my predecessor, Kwame Osai. We want to prevent and cure diabetes, obesity, and metabolic disease through innovative research and discovery. Our mission is to develop a state-of-the-art research enterprise that partners with our expansive uh, clinical programs to improve the life and well-being of our patients with diabetes. So one of the programs that we have focused on is prevention. And indeed, we have an NIH program now to prevent diabetes in a very vulnerable group, and that is Mexican-American young women. Young, at least for me, because they're between 20 and 39 years old. So these ladies are always very busy. They have uh, multiple children. They have parents to take care of. They're the family sort of breadwinners, guides. And it was thought that they could never join a program like this because they're too busy, too overwhelmed with life. So we developed a uh, program that is cultural and gender specific to try to engage these ladies into a healthy lifestyle. We identified those who had prediabetes. We invited them into our program and we talked a lot about uh, lifestyle and exercise and talked about doing it in their communities and working within the families to accomplish this goal. And I'm happy to say that our, uh, our major coordinator, Dr. Via Gomez, is visiting us today from Houston where this study is ongoing. Um, and she's played a major role in lifestyle changes and weight loss, but we also find that in most cases, drug intervention is also necessary. So our goal is to define the right drug for the right patient and immediately work in any individual to reach goals of preventing diabetes by improving uh, beta cell function. And beta cells are important because they produce diabetes. And at the time of prediabetes, 50% already of beta cells are lost by the time diabetes sets in itself, 
almost all the beta cells are gone. Our next goal is to work with African American women. Why did we pick African American women? It was astounding to us that in the age range I told you, 20 to 39 years old, there's a staggering 56% rate of obesity. That means more than half of these wonderful young women are obese. There, unfortunately, are 2.9 million African American women in the United States with pre-diabetes who are just waiting to go on to type 2 diabetes. And we figured that in these women over a lifetime, if we could prevent diabetes, we would save $7.5 trillion. Can you imagine what that would do for the U.S. debt? Uh, so, so this is a huge amount of money that we need to really focus on to prevent diabetes. So our goal is to develop, as we said, a gender and culturally specific program for these ladies and also uh, try to define the best drug for the individual patient. And it's probably the best drug for an African American woman may not be the best drug for a um, Mexican American women. But the problem now is we, the, the prescription says, go exercise, eat less, and take this drug, which is usually metformin, which is a 50-year-old drug. So we have new drugs. We need to find out which ones work in which individuals. Now, the other thing we know, because more and more bariatric surgery is occurring, that it actually really helps these obese patients. So a patient can go with diabetes, can go in maybe on three, four drugs, maybe on insulin, and get bariatric surgery. Shockingly, within days, you know, they try to get you in and out of the hospital, so we try to get these patients out by three days post-op. Three days post-op to a week post-op, patients walk out of the hospital following bariatric surgery on no diabetic medication. So they were taking all this beforehand, but before losing massive amounts of weights, their diabetes is, quote, cured. And some of these patients can stay in remission up to 10 years. Some of them, unfortunately, within years, start to get diabetes again. But what is this immediate cure that relieves many of these complications that we talked about? Um, and uh, lipid levels improve, cardiovascular profiles improve, sleep apnea improves, depression improves, everything can improve. So what is the magic bullet? At OSU, we do uh, about 300 bariatric surgeries a year, and one of our goals is to try to figure out what is the magic in bariatric surgery. So I won't belabor this, but we know that uh, uh, there's a lot of inflammation and all that visceral fat. In my own lab, it's trying to understand how the immune cells actually promote inflammatory processes that then cause all the total body harm that you heard about. So we know that there's some changes in inflammatory processes uh, once you get obese and then after you lose weight. The question is, or after you've had bariatric surgery, does this inflammatory process in the visceral fat improve? We also know that there, that there are many hormones, uh, particularly produced by the gut. And glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1, is one of those. And GLP-1 is important because it stimulates uh, beta cell insulin secretion, so it helps to promote insulin release. We also know that there's a lot of change after bariatric surgery in bile acids. They go up and they activate certain receptors, which also can markedly improve metabolism. And finally, when you're manipulating the gut and taking part of the stomach and the intestine out, we know that there's alterations in gut bacteria or microbiota. 
And there's a lot of fascinating research now to suggest that if you alter microbiota, you can alter many diseases, particularly metabolism and inflammatory processes. So we're trying to examine how all of these mechanisms may work. So if we put together a special surgical pill, we know we want to put the glucagon-like peptide one in that pill, and that's easy because it's already available as a treatment choice for patients with diabetes. We know that we can maybe put a, um, a special bile salt to activate some of these receptors, and in fact, we have a study starting to use one of these uh, bile acid receptors to improve metabolism. We can add a probiotic maybe to change the gut flora to one that's that causes better metabolism. And we're also thinking maybe we can develop an anti-inflammatory uh, uh, mechanism, such as a vaccine. So the pill is gonna contain many components to try to ultimately act like surgery and cure diabetes. So we need to stop this horrible epidemic. I think at a, at a national level, prediabetes should be recognized as an early disease. We need to find the strategy for prevention and cure and try to make it individual. And importantly, research pro partnerships with diverse interests will help to speed up this whole process. So thank you very much. <laughs>